In this video, I will introduce classification trees as well as bagging and random forests, which are resampling techniques used to make prediction rules from individual trees more generalizable to new data. An excellent introduction to these techniques can be found in a 2009 article from Psychological Methods, and the authors include our syntax for all their examples using the party package. For their ease of use, I will use the R part package to introduce classification trees and the random forest package to introduce bagging and random forests. The party package provides more robust algorithms for unbiased predictions and variable selection, uh, requiring users to become familiar with more tuning options. The goal of this video is not to provide a thorough tutorial about applications in R, but to use R to provide a brief introduction to the concepts of classification trees. I will use example data collected to explain voting behavior in 2010. There are 466 observations, and only a few uh, variables are presented here. An arbitrary ID variable, the age of the respondents, and self-reported level of conservatism using a 9-point Likert scale from 0, meaning very liberal, to 8, meaning very conservative. They use the same nine-point Likert scale to indicate the degree to which their votes were influenced uh, from zero, not at all, to eight, very much, by each of four factors. The opinions of others in their political party, the opinions of their party leaders, the contents of a candidate's platform or political message, and their own political beliefs. Finally, their vote is classified uh, by whether they voted for a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent. Because these are coded 1, 2, 3 in the data, we would like to treat this not numerically uh, 1, 2, 3, but we would like to treat it as a factor and with labels that make sense, so I'm adding a, uh, a labeled factor to this data. And we can see that 185 people voted for the Republican candidates, 130 voted for the Democratic candidates, and 151 voted independent. For the sake of cross-validation, we will divide our 466 observations into a training set and a validation set. The training set can also be called learning data and sources, and validation sets might also be called holdout data or, uh, or test data. We will use all other variables besides ID to predict voting behavior in the trading set. The set of prediction rules we develop will then be tested by using them on the validation set and seeing how accurate the predictions are. We will use the R part package to grow an individual classification tree or decision tree. And we will use the random forest package to grow a forest of such trees on bootstrap samples from the same data in order to improve predictive accuracy. Right, so I've already installed these packages. I'm going to save my formula. I'm going to load the R part package. And I can use the question mark for R part to look up the help page. The R part function is used to grow a classification tree, which we can save in an object called mod1. We can view the decision rules by printing or plotting the tree. A tree is depicted as a series of nodes, each of which is associated with a certain subsample, and a decision rule for further dividing the subsample into finer categories. Look at the first node and notice that the full sample is first divided or according to whether participants indicated their level of conservatism above or below 3.5. Why is this? To illustrate how a classification or decision tree is grown, let's look at every level of every variable that we use for classification. If we were to split up a continuous predictor into high or low, then we could look at the contingency table between that binary split and the outcome. We have to choose a variable to split 
and which value, uh, which value to use as the point to split the variable. Different criteria can be used, such as the Gini index or entropy, but for the purposes of this illustration, we could consider the more familiar chi-squared statistic for independence. The criterion for the optimal choice is the variable and the value that provide the greatest chi-squared from the resulting contingency table for the outcome and newly split predictor. Let's look at the chi-squared values from choosing any level of conservatism as the split points. Notice that 3.5 yields the greatest chi-squared value, implying that this is the point which forms the groups that, that are the most different from each other in terms of voting behavior. Investigating chi-square values for all of the remaining predictors reveals that no other split points yield groups that are any more different from each other. Each node forms more branches down the tree until no significantly different groups can be formed in the subsamples at the bottom nodes. The predict function can be used to find predicted probabilities each participant has of voting for each party, as well as the predicted vote, which is the highest probability. For instance, the first observation is most likely to vote for the Republican Party. 71 and a quarter percent chance. So the predicted vote is for the Republican candidate. Likewise, the second and third candidates are most likely to vote for the independent and democratic candidates, respectively. You could form a variable indicating whether the vote was correct by testing whether it was equal to the actual indicated vote. Notice that the tree predicts the correct vote for the first several observa observations. Not until we get down here. We can make a table comparing the predicted votes to actual votes called a confusion matrix. If the tree works well, we should see that the highest counts are on the diagonal. errors are off the diagonal, but the diagonal represents correct, correctly predicted votes. We can also print some column proportions here to indicate the power or sensitivity or hit rate. Since they're column percentages, they all add up to 100%, and you can see here that out of all the people who actually voted Democrat, 65.5% of them were correctly predicted to vote that way. Out of all the Repub people who actually voted for the Republican candidates, 85% were actually predicted to vote that way. Out of all the independents, 40% were predicted to vote that way. We can also print out row proportions. Right. Row proportions present uh, positive predicted values along the diagonal. So, out of all the people who were predicted to vote for the Democratic candidate, 55% actually did. Out of all the people who were predicted to vote for the Republican candidate, 67% did. And out of all the people who were predicted to vote for the Independent Party, 70% did. Now that we have a tree, that is a set of rules for classification or prediction, we can test how accurate they are by using it on a new set of data. This was the purpose of the holdout or validation or test data. Again, we can use the predict function, but now we supply the holdout data, the validation data, using the new data argument.
as we did for the original data, we can store predicted votes. For instance, the first observation in the holdout data is clearly going to be predicted to vote for the independent candidate, whereas the second observation in the holdout data is going to be predicted to vote for the Republican candidate using the rules that were created from the original tree. We can store the predicted votes and compare them to the actual votes in the holdout data. Right. You should again see the highest counts along the diagonal. Likewise, the column and row proportions indicate uh, well, column, column proportions indicate power or hit rates along the diagonal. And uh, the diagonal of row proportions indicates the positive predicted values. You might notice that the predictions did not appear as accurate for the new data as they were for the data used to grow the tree in the first place. This is the problem of overfitting to data the lack of generalizability. To improve generalizability, we must take into account the uncertainty due to taking a finite sample from a population. Although we do not have the full population, we can mimic the process of replicating our experiment many times by taking bootstrap samples and growing a tree using each bootstrap sample. To illustrate, let's take a random sample from our original data. We took, we took the sample with replacement. Sources with details about bootstrapping can be found online. Notice that some observations can appear more than once. They can be resampled multiple times. For example, 1423 appears in the second and third rows of this bootstrap sample. If we grow another tree using a bootstrap sample, then we can use that new decision rule on every observation in the original sample. Notice here that when I use the predict function, I'm using the new tree that I've just grown, and I'm supplying to the new data statement the original training data. Notice that the first observation is predicted correctly, and the second is incorrectly predicted to vote Democrat when they actually voted independent. When we take another bootstrap sample and repeat this process, the second observation is now correctly predicted to vote in for the independent party candidate. Now imagine we repeat, say, 1,000 times this process of taking bootstrap samples, growing a new tree, and using it to predict votes in the original data we would have a forest of a thousand such trees, which is called a random forest. And it has been shown to give more generalizable predictions than a single tree, which is overfit to any particular data set. Research has shown that it is also beneficial to randomly sample predictors to use for each tree. Random forests are the more general case when both observations and variables are randomly sampled. And bagging is a special case when all the available predictors are used to grow each tree. The random forest function automates this process. Let's load the package. All right, printing or plotting the forest does not show a single set of classification rules like the output from R parts did, because the classifications are made by choosing the mode or the most common classification for each observation across all the trees in the forest. Rather, the print method is simply the confusion matrix. 
with some actual and observed votes in, uh, in rows, along with the type 2 error rates within each group of actual votes, That's this class error column. As with an individual tree, the predict function can be used to calculate uh, probabilities of voting for each party. And now instead of saying type equals uh, class, we'll say type equals response, and that will give us the, uh, the most likely vote or classification. But the individual probabilities are still type equals prob. All right, so using all the trees in the forest, most of those trees, that is about 70% of them, or 69.9 and change, percent of all the trees in the forest, said that this first observation would be uh, most likely to vote for the Republican candidate. And so the forest predicts that, it will vote, that this person will vote Republican. Uh, likewise, the second observation, out of all the thousand in the trees in the, in the forest, um, most of them said this person will most likely vote for a Democratic candidate. And so that is the predicted vote. So again, we can create uh, a variable indicating whether the classifications were correct, whether the predicted votes matched the actual votes. Right, trues and falses here indicating whether the classification was correct, as well as a uh, confusion matrix of counts. We do not, in this case, see the largest counts on the diagonal. And notice here, this one's, these are both larger than the, uh, the counts that we see on the diagonal. Well, many values are larger than the ones we see on the diagonal. All right, and again, the uh, row proportions, or column proportions indicates uh, power, uh, hit rates, and uh, the row proportions indicate positive predicted values. Likewise, we can also validate this more robust classification tree on a new you know, holdout validation test data by simply supplying the validation data to the new data, new data uh, arguments to the predict function. And we can expect it via the same matrices. Notice in this one, the highest counts are once again on the diagonal. So although the uh, random forest looked like it was performing somewhat poorly on the training data on which, with which the, the forest was actually built, we can see that that set of classification rules does seem to hold up better on new data. It's more generalizable. That is, these predictions are uh, more, more accurate on average. And of all the people who are observed to vote uh, for the Democratic candidates, most of them, again, were predicted to vote for that candidate. Out of all the people who did vote Republican, most of them were predicted to vote Republican. And the other way around, out of all the people who were predicted to vote Democrat, most of them actually did. Out of all the people who were predicted to vote Republican, most of them actually did. Among all the people who vote, uh, were predicted to vote Independent, however, uh, there's a split among all the People who are predicted to vote independent, uh, just as many were predict uh, actually did vote independent as actually did vote Democrat. So it's still not perfect. It seems like we need some variables that can better discriminate uh, between who is likely to vote independent or not. But Democrat and Republican predictions seem to be doing pretty well. This has been a brief conceptual introduction to classification trees, as well as bagging and random forests. Uh, using R for illustrations. I hope you find it helpful. Thank you for watching.